Guys, welcome to a new video. We have a special guest joining us today, Mr. Dirk Durham, AKA The Bugler. If you are not familiar with Dirk, you may have seen him on some of the Land of the Free series we did back in the day with the Born and Raised crew. You may have seen him as part of the Phelps Game Calls team. Uh, Dirk is, how many times have you won calling competitions? Uh, a couple. A couple. A couple. <laughs> He's very humble, but uh, arguably one of the best elk callers you're ever gonna find, one of the best elk hunters, archery elk hunters, uh, specifically that you're ever gonna run into. And he is here today. We're gonna do some elk call 101 stuff. So Dirk's gonna run us through some basics on getting started using a diaphragm call. We're gonna introduce a couple of the new Hush Signature Series calls that is produced and manufactured by Phelps. And then Dirk's gonna kinda run us through a bunch of different situational uh, type scenarios where we can listen to him do a variety of calls. Everything from maybe a lost calf, challenge bugle, a lip ball, and have him put together some great sequences, hopefully so you can walk away uh, feeling a little more confident as we prepare for archery elk season, which is going to be here before you know it. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, we have introduced a couple new calls to the edition. These are the Hush Signature Series calls. Phelps has produced them on their amp frame, and Dirk's gonna walk us through kind of the differences between the two, why you might consider one over the other, or maybe you decide to go ahead and grab both. They're 10 bucks each on the website, and they're gonna pair nicely with the Hush branded bugle tubes. We've had these for several years, and uh, we've also had the external easy asterisk cow calls that are kind of branded with our logo. So we've got the full repertoire to get you dialed for this fall, and so we'll learn a little bit more about each of these calls. So starting off, we got the straight seven, which is the black tape. And this is gonna be one that is gonna be a little easier possibly to blow. Walk us through some of the features and benefits of the straight seven. So the straight seven, it's got a really light latex. Light latex equals not a lot of air pressure to make a sound out of it. So for guys that like to call lightly or have a hard time mustering a lot of air pressure to go through, they're gonna love this one. Um, it's, these are all stretched really tight nice and tight, which equals high pitched sounds. Um, you can hit those high screaming notes with them. And then also that with that tight stretch comes longevity. So that way out of the package, it seems a little tight, but when it breaks into that sweet spot, it stays there for a really long time. And they just don't wear out in a couple days. Here's what that straight seven sounds like. With that higher, with that tight stretch and that thinner latex, you can make some beautiful cow calls too and that really nice little calf call, which everybody's kind of, it's kind of trendy right now to have a calf call. All right, so that is a little teaser of the straight seven. So now let's jump into the other one. So the decibel is gonna be the orange tape on the amp frame. Talk to us about the features and the benefits of this specific diaphragm. So the decibel, the name is kind of addictive to what the uh, thing's all about. It's a thicker latex. Thicker latex means more air pressure. It's gonna take a little more air to make this thing go. And with that more air pressure, it's gonna be louder. So for those location bugles, you know, reaching way off deep in those deep canyons and stuff, this thing's gonna perform really nicely. And thicker latex also is very durable. It's gonna last a long time. It's got a really nice tight stretch on it. That way you don't, don't stretch it out in the first day of calling. And the cow calls are a little bit chirpy right out of the bag, but I promise you, once you get this thing stretched in, they're gonna sound beautiful and, and very consistent, and it's gonna last a long time. All right, so there's a quick little taster, again, of the straight seven, the decibel. Uh, you can find these on our website, and they'll be a great addition to your fall archery hunting repertoire. Uh, we also have the Easy Estrus external cow call. I'm gonna have Dirk kind of run through just a quick little tutorial on that one. And then we're gonna jump into some more how-to, some tips, some tactics. Uh, whether you've used a diaphragm call in the past or maybe you've never tried doing it and you'd like to try, we'll kind of have Dirk run through some of the easiest ways to get started and maybe some little you know, tips to kind of help you out of the gate. All right guys, this is the Hush Easy Estrus. 
Um, this thing is great for long distance calling. It's great for up close. You can get quiet with it if you want to, or you can be super loud and obnoxious. You can hit all those um, estrus type calls. You can hit cow, calf calls, very versatile, pretty easy to use. Now, right out of the bag, the little rubber ring here is kind of set a little bit high for my liking. I like to roll it down just a little bit more. And what I do is I find the sweet spot on the call. And then I use that rubber band as a place mark. That's gonna help a lot. Especially in, um, in high pressure and tense situations, you got a big bull coming in and you get a little bit excited. <laughs> you don't wanna sound like that, right? You don't wanna to have to search for that sweet spot every time. So that's why I like to put that, that rubber band down to that sweet spot and use it for a marker. So I kind of move it down just a little bit until I find that sweet spot. I think it's right about there. Yeah, notice my lips will come up real tight on that. Now if you want to increase the sound a little bit, just lay your finger right across the top of the reed right here. Put it right here, and that, that'll increase the sound a bit for that long distance calling. And get really quiet too. All right, so you can kind of see there's uh, various options, whether you're using the diaphragm calls or the Easy Estrus external call. You can really make a lot of cow, calf variety sounds. Everything uh, from kind of the easier, lighter calf sound to maybe a little bit more of a mature cow and estrus. And then obviously you just saw what Dirk was able to do with the external call by adjusting the little rubber grommet uh, to the liking that you might find within the call that you grab. And obviously you can get a variety of volumes out of that situation. All right, so now we're gonna jump into some tips and some tactics. How do we get started? Uh, whether or not, again, you've never used a diaphragm call at all, or you've used one for quite a, quite a while, but you're just maybe looking for some additional ideas on how to get a different type of tone or sound out of it. Okay, Dirk. Okay. What are, you've been doing this for a long time, it is literally second nature to you. This is, you make it sound so incredibly easy. What are your top three tips for folks just kind of getting started or looking to improve the way they sound and or use a diaphragm call? Okay, um, I'm just gonna speak to like your, your viewers have never had an elk yeah. call in their mouth before. Maybe you're a seasoned vet but I feel like you gotta crawl before you walk. You have to hit those fundamentals. Don't take your call right out of the package and blow it and think, man, I'm gonna make a big bugle, because that can be really frustrating. You pull it out of the package, you blow on it, and you're like, gee whiz, I don't sound a thing like Dirk. I've been doing this like 33 years, so it's gonna take a little practice for you to catch up. But what you need to do is learn the fundamentals. So you wanna put your call in your mouth. We'll go with this uh, straight seven here. Um, very light call, and what we want to do is we want to put this at the roof of our mouth. We're going to put it like this, latex down towards our tongue, the little metal thing towards the roof of our mouth, and this rounded part towards the back of our throat. So you want to seat that kind of in the middle of your palate. And you want to use the part of your tongue that feels the strongest. If you were to envision you had a, a grape on your tongue, it's kind of a weird analogy, but if you had a grape on your tongue and you want to crush that grape with your tongue, find that spot on your tongue that's the very strongest because you want to flex that tongue up and make it hard. You want to push that right against the roof of your mouth, push it against the call, and you want to seal off all the air. Now don't just seal the air on the roof of your mouth and let the air bypass around your teeth. You want to seal off every bit of air. And then you want to Relax your tongue just the ever so slightly and let a little bit of air seep out across the latex between the latex and your tongue and you want to make a little mosquito noise. Once you get that mosquito noise, you may at first sound like this. If you're getting a noise like that, you need to push harder with your tongue. Flex, not push more air pressure, push harder with your tongue. It doesn't take a lot of air pressure to make this thing start making noise. So push really hard, get that mosquito noise. Once you get that, then practice that. It seems kind of boring, it seems kind of rudimentary, but what we're learning is muscle memory for your tongue to, to know exactly where to put that call every time you want to make that noise. 
Also, you're learning control. You want to take a deep breath, make that mosquito noise, and let all of your breath out. And through the different amounts of air pressure that you got coming through your lungs, then you may have to change the fluctuation of pressure on your tongue as well to maintain that mosquito noise. So by doing this, you're gonna create consistency. So once you get that down pat and you're like, okay, all right, Dirk, I'm done making mosquito noise. Perfect, it's, start, it's time to start walking a little bit. So you can relax your tongue. Once you attain that mosquito noise, relax your tongue a little bit and let your jaw drop. And it'll sound something like this. That's how you make a cow call. So with that cow call, is there any sound or noise you're making? If you could relate it to like a syllable or a word that you're trying to achieve to get that mosquito noise and then the ultimate mm -hmm. cow call as you kind of bring it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you want to kind of make a ea, ea, kind of with, yeah. it's going to be that kind of a same ea. You're dropping your tongue, you're dropping your jaw a little bit. A lot of people will say eo, eo, but when you do eo, it distorts the sound and makes it sound weird. It doesn't sound like an elf, really. So that's eo. E, that's eo. Now try and we don't out. really want to do that. Yeah. I want to drop that jaw. I want to keep your mouth, your lips, just kind of stationary, relaxed. We're not trying to flex them or anything. Now you can do a little bit of different lip movements and stuff as you get a little more advanced to kind of shoot pitches this way and that way and kind of change the pitch a little bit. That comes later once you learn how to walk. <laughs> so that's a good little introduction to the sounds you're going to want to make to try to A, just get comfortable with the diaphragm, you know, in your mouth, getting used to that, the air pressure, and then also I think it's key having those syllables or those words that you can practice without even a call in your mouth, just to get familiar with like the movement of dropping your jaw and then incorporating the diaphragm back into that equation and starting to get those rudimentary sounds of a cow call or a calf call as you're kind of, to, to Dirk's analogy, learning how to crawl out of the gate. So now that we have kind of the fundamentals down on the calf cow situation, let's transition into some of the introductions on learning to make the noise of the bugle. Okay, everybody's favorite sound, the bugle, right? <laughs> Everybody right. wants to make that. So we gotta go back to the basics. We're gonna do that mosquito noise. It's gonna be a lot longer note. And then when we drop off, it's not gonna be that nice smooth transition of the cow call. It's gonna be more abrupt. We're just gonna drop our jaw, drop our tongue. And then at the end, we're gonna, we're gonna give this noise. We're gonna inflect our voice. Like somebody punched us in the gut, ooh. So envision, like some, some guys struggle with this too because there's a little bit of timing. Some people want to, they'll want to introduce that before the call ends. So here, here it sounds without the tube. Now, if you get a little too premature, your voice will bleed into the diaphragm sound. It doesn't quite sound natural. So you want to let that diaphragm stop buzzing just a little bit as you drop your jaw and then immediately give that punch to the gut. That's kind of a locator bugle. Now, if you want to do a full bugle, we're going to try something a little different. So tongue position, remember that mosquito noise, We'll loosen it up and get, take it down to the very far end of the spectrum, kind of like where you were at, where you end your cow call. So you're just gonna barely have a little bit of a buzz. It doesn't take hardly any tongue pressure to make that sound. So that's the beginning of your bugle. Now you're gonna inflect a little bit of voice at the beginning too. So you're not gonna go like you're a bear. You're gonna, you're making noise. <laughs> I'm a bear. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna make a noise kind of like you're clearing your throat, some phlegm out of your throat. And once you start getting that note, then you're gonna push hard with your tongue, take it back up to mosquito, hold it, and then drop it off and take the punch to the gut.
You don't want to draw out the back end though, where you kind of drop off. You can, and, and you know, if you want to mix up your bugles a little bit, but a lot of folks will kind of draw, draw it out too long, and it kind of sounds unnatural. <laughs> We don't want to do that. Now that's a good practice just to learn control, just to, to learn the, the lows to highs and lows to highs. And that's a really great practice to just get that muscle memory down to do this, kind of the, the old, uh, the siren. And it's annoying as hell. You might want to do it. <laughs> might want to do it on your commute to work, or maybe in the closet, so you don't make the mat, the misses mad. So, <laughs> absolutely. So, now that we've kind of learned the fundamentals of the beginning sounds of the bugle, if you had to associate, kind of like we did with cow call, a certain vowel or word that you're using to inflect, particularly at the end, is there anything that kind of comes to mind that could maybe help folks easily visualize what they should be kind of saying or sounding like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you just want to kind of go, uh, yeah, uh, You want to just drop it off hard on the back yeah. end. Okay. And get that punch to the gut. And, it, and when you give that punch to the gut, you get a lot of like, you're putting a lot of air and a lot of kind of bass, like almost like you're beatboxing a little bit. Sure. Uh, uh, psh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked <Wicked> band. <laughs> Well, I think to your point, uh, for a lot of folks getting started, they may have a tendency to try to create all of their air pressure just from like their throat, right. not necessarily from their diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So probably not a lot different than singers, you know, they're right. trying to hit the high note, they've got to sing from the diaphragm mm -hmm. versus just like their quote unquote head note or whatever it's called, if you're in the music industry. Um, and I think that's critical for being able to get that volume projected, particularly if you're in a hunting situation where you might be dealing with some wind or some terrain, some timber that's gonna really dampen the sound of your bugle as you're trying to get out there and locate a bull. Right, absolutely. Okay, so Dirk's kind of walked us through the basics of getting started with the cow calls, calf calls, uh, the fundamentals of creating those mosquito sounds. Then we transition over into learning the basics of a bugle. So we're gonna have Dirk kind of circle back one more time. We're gonna walk through the locator bugle, a full bugle, and then we'll kind of complete it with the challenge bugle. Once we do that, we're going to transition into some more advanced tactics and tips, uh, chuckles, barks, screams, mix and mashing all of those together to come up uh, really with some incredible sounds. So without further ado, Dirk, let's get started with the locator bugle. Arguably probably the most common bugle when guys are out hunting, really trying to identify where a bull may be or, you know, they're hunting. And I'd say that's, that's probably step one, right? Right, right. This is usually the first bugle that I make in every spot I bugle from, Yep. which might be 200 times a day, Yeah. right? But it's just that clear, crisp, high, loud, long carrying note, it's not aggressive. I hit that mosquito noise. I use a little bit of different tongue pressure to kind of articulate a couple of no notes so it sounds authentic. And then I drop it off and it sounds something like this. And you can let that thing carry out for you know two three seconds you want to get that long note that's going to carry a lot a long ways you know way off in those deep canyons or up into those big high ridge lines so jumping into some strategy sessions tied to the locator bugle to dirk's point he mentioned that he may do this 200 times a day essentially sound checking you are probably doing it potentially on the top of a ridge or up into a draw. Any little terrain topography that could hold a bull that's either bedded, maybe he's with his cows, maybe he's transitioning from a feeding area to a bedding area or vice versa. It's really just trying to say, hey, I'm a bull, I'm up here, where are you at? Right? Right, absolutely. I like to kind of leave no stones unturned. Um, I like to use a fishing analogy. So you don't just walk up the creek and just kind of throw your lure out there and reel it in once and be like, well, no fish here, let's go home. No, you look at every rock that sits out in the stream. And a lot of times that's where the fish kind of hole up. So you, you cast your lure right behind each rock, test on each spot. And you might spend 30 minutes in that one spot. I may not spend 30 minutes in one spot calling. I may spend 15 minutes, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. But I want to make sure I've covered every little spot 
and give a few different wide variety of bugles before I hike on to the next area. But as I'm walking through the ridge, out across this ridge line, I'm casting my lures or casting my bugles down in every little draw. It's crazy, sometimes just with different topography, I can call a whole bunch right here, walk 100 yards and hear elk that I couldn't hear before. They've probably heard me, but maybe not. But it's just weird terrain features you gotta kind of watch for. And if you just think, oh, I'm gonna walk here, bugle once and walk a mile and bugle again, you probably are gonna miss some elk that are talking. I, uh, just to touch on that, so typically when I've gone and kind of done the program like you're talking about, I don't know if it's true or not, but I always felt like sometimes it just takes getting close enough to that bull. So like he may have even heard me from over here, but he's just like, okay, not interested. But like once I got a little close in his bedroom or whatever, mm -hmm. he, you know, because how many times have we bugled, 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 and it seems like just that one time you got a little closer to him, he's then screams and it's like, whoa, dude, good thing we didn't, you know, bypass this little drainage or whatever and mm -hmm. gave him a few chances. Do you think it's because they didn't hear you or do you think it, it could be because like you're, you just got too close and now they're pissed? I think, I think it's because you get too close and now, now you're a threat. Now you're in his little spot. And elk, especially even if, if they're bachelored up, or not bachelored up, but singled out, like yeah. right pre-rut and they've got their little bull bedrooms and they haven't, they haven't left them to go find cows yet, they'll be really defensible at that little spot, mm -hmm. you know? And if you get too close to that spot, they'll answer and they'll say, hey, get out of here, this spot's taken. <laughs> Kind of like uh, Forrest Gump on the school bus. Kind of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this <laughs> seat's taken. <laughs> this seat's taken. <laughs> but, uh, and also I've had it where you'll bugle, 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 and you're almost out of earshot and we'll answer kind of back their ways. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they were curious enough, like, hey, get back here. I don't want yeah. you just, you know, running around, you know, in my area. So sometimes right as you kind of get out of a, like a little zone there, they'll answer. So yeah. that's why you just want to really call quite a bit. I think there's another component to the terrain topography and the landscape that you're hunting. If you've ever been with someone where uh, you might have a buddy calling behind you someplace, there's certain situations where you can barely hear your friend calling just based on the topography or the type of terrain that's there. Maybe it's a, you know, it's a dense thicket and that projection of the bugle is just not getting that far. Different weather conditions can also impact that. So if it's potentially cloudy or foggy, it can really dampen the bugle down. So to Dirk's point, by just kind of moving around and getting, you know, gathering different angles and really trying to like uncover each little stone before you move to the next place, I think is also good on just being super thorough. And lo and behold, you may just get a boulder to, an to answer to you that you didn't, you know, two minutes earlier, 25 yards away. Yeah, and it's crazy because I've, I've been in a situation before where Maybe my buddy's up here on the ridge, and I've dropped in and did some calling or whatever. And he, he's like, "What happened?" I'm like, "I couldn't hear him anymore." He's like, "He bugled the whole time. He was yeah. screaming." I'm like, "I didn't hear a thing down there." For sure. So it's weird unless you get walk out the right ridge, you take the wrong ridge or the wrong draw or something. Sometimes you just get out of earshot and you just can't hear them. They can hear you, but you just can't hear them. Yeah. Okay, so we've gone over the locator bugle certainly one that you're going to probably do over and over and over and over and over again as you're out hunting and just trying to turn up a bull now that we've maybe turned a bull up it is time to transition into a fuller bugle so Dirk's going to walk us through the fundamentals of the fuller bugle kind of like you heard a little bit earlier when he was just getting started it's just going to be a little bit more of an, ag an aggressive kind of a tone so he's going to walk us through that and then we'll touch on a few scenarios with that so the full bugle it's uh, maybe your quintessential elk bugle that you hear on everybody's ringtone or on a movie or, or whatever. It's just, you know, it's just kind of that low to high note and back down to the, back down to the low note. Um, with or without grunts, with or without the scooter stick, um, just depends on how you want to play it. But usually my second bugle in a location situation is that full bugle. And a lot of times I'll throw in a couple of grunts at the end. So from a situation standpoint, if you haven't located a bull yet on your first locator bugle, you'll transition to that bugle. A little bit more of an aggressive call, maybe that's the one that's gonna get them sparked. Absolutely. There's been weird times over the years, I've had bulls that wouldn't answer unless I chuckled or grunted. I don't know why, What? that's what they liked. And I'm always kind of experimenting, if you will, uh, with what bulls wanna hear. And whenever I start getting some interest or it really fires them up with a certain thing, I stick to that. So through my experimentation, I finally get one to answer. 
or I don't, then it depends on how I progress with the next calls I make. Sure. On the different scenario, let's say that initial locator bugle got a response, you've made a move to cover some distance and you're kind of getting set up on the bull. Would you go directly into like a fuller bugle at that point in time if they're re actively responding to you? Absolutely. I'd give them, a, I'd, I'd kind of stick with those full bugles. You know, maybe he, maybe I grunted or yeah. chuckled, then I'll kind of stick with those until okay. that doesn't work anymore. And I usually call it the bull's disposition, you know. That way I don't kind of don't overdo it or underdo it. If he's being kind of mellow and making wimpy bugles, I'm going to be kind of mellow and make wimpy bugles. If he's hot and cutting me off, it's time to pull out all the pull out all the stops <laughs> and maybe hit him with those challenge bugles yeah. and uh, and get real aggressive. All right, so that, that was a perfect segue. Uh, we've gone through the locator bugle, we've gone through the full bugle. Now we're gonna touch on the challenge bugle. I think a lot of guys also love to blow the challenge bugle because in theory, you're in a position where you've got a bull responding to you that is active, that is pretty fired up, and lo and behold, uh, you might just have that opportunity to get a shot very shortly thereafter. So the challenge bugle, what are the differences in the challenge bugle that maybe you don't necessarily see in the full bugle. So challenge bugle is going to be similar to that full bugle, except it's going to be amped up. We're going to put a lot more air pressure. We're going to we're going to shorten it, so we're not going to take our time climbing that scale. We're going to we're going to go right up the scale and hit that high note and just scream it and then drop it off. We want to show lots of emotion. I think guys kind of they they're afraid to kind of get too emotional with their calls, so they make that cookie cutter quintessential full bugle time and time and time again. Doug Flutie, if you will, yeah. um, which shows no emotion, which a lot of times doesn't elicit an aggressive reaction from the bull. So by hit doing that aggressive challenge bugle, then that's telling that bull, hey, I'm done with your messing around with you. Let's fight. Without further ado, the challenge bugle. You want to do that super loud, super emotional. You can get as crazy as you want to. I mean, you can even buzz your lips a little bit. I mean, whatever, whatever you do, if you, maybe you're gonna blow so hard, I get, I kind of get a little carried away. I'll, I'll kind of blow so hard sometimes it distorts the read. Yeah. It makes it sound weird. But sometimes bulls, when they get really pissed, they sound kind of weird. So I'm not too worried about it at that point. <clears throat> I just want that bull to know I'm really mad and I want to fight. Okay, so that was kind of like the three most common bugles you're gonna use in the field. Now we're gonna jump into some more advanced calls and sounds that oftentimes are a bigger struggle, let's be honest. When you get into the grunts, the chuckles, the lip balls, those have a tendency to present more challenges for folks than maybe your standard bugle or a cow call. So Dirk, walk us through some tips on getting started with like your chuckle. We can start with the chuckle. Okay, chuckles and grunts, they're all about cadence and rhythm. If you don't have the right cadence and rhythm, they don't sound right. And a lot of times that's the easy way to pick out a hunter up on the mountain. You hear, you know, some weird chuckles and grunts that they kind of, they do a couple quick ones and, the, and then they slow down and then they pick back up or they do just a weird, a weird speed on the, on, the, on the beat of them. And you're like, that's not an elk. Yeah. Sometimes elk will do some weird stuff, but I think that's, that's most important and key is your, is your cadence and rhythm. The, probably the best way to get your cadence and rhythm down is as soon as you exhale and make the call, you inhale. So exhale, inhale, ex exhale, inhale, back and forth. It's kind of tricky, so a lot of guys will try to just one breath it and then do a whole bunch of chuckles or a whole bunch of grunts with that one, one breath, yeah, sure. but that's where you kind of get off rhythm. The easiest way to describe a chuckle or a grunt is, remember that cow call we learned how to make, it's gonna be that same tongue action, but we're gonna shorten it up and put a lot more air pressure onto it. It's more like more of an exaggerated cow call. And you're gonna inflect your voice at the end. Remember that punch to the gut? We're gonna do that every time. So don't try to do a whole string of them at first. Make a perfect one. Take your deep breath, make another perfect one. Take your deep breath, make a, another perfect one until you get very, very confident in making that per perfect one every time. Then you can speed up your rhythm and cadence. I kind of like to uh, think of like a choo-choo train. Cha, 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 cha. You kind of speed up that tempo from the slow to the, so practice that. So just to learn how to control your cadence. <coughs> 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 
Sounds like, it sounds terrible without a tube too. Sure, yeah, I yeah. mean, there's a lot of guys say, do I even need a tube? Yes, you do. I mean, there's people that, have, and I have done it in the past where I've called in elk without a tube, but it's no fun and it doesn't sound very good. Yeah. Sometimes people would be like, there's a dying rabbit over there or something. <laughs> so putting it into a tube, it sounds a lot more authentic. <laughs> You can you can experiment with the tempo. You know, you speed up a little bit and then you kind of slow up, slow down. But a lot of people make the mistake of that one breath and then they get these weird. It it almost sounds like a turkey or something. It just doesn't sound right. So lots of air in, lots of air out, and and then get that rhythm down. He makes it look so easy, truthfully. Uh, <laughs> lots of practice, guys. Remember. Don't expect to sound amazing out of the gate. It's gonna take a long time. So what's the biggest difference then between the chuckle and the grunt? So chuckles are a lot faster pace. They're a lot quicker. Grunts are a lot longer. And in my opinion, you know, well, a lot of opinions say, well, you can't tell a bull by its bugle or whatever. But a lot of times I've found like a, a young bull, like a two and a half year old bull, raghorn, they have this weird little chuckle. They kind of almost sound kind of unsure of themselves. Like, <laughs> like they're just learning how to do it. They're, they've just found their voice and they're trying to figure it out. A 10 year old bull, he don't sound like that. Yeah. And he, he chuckles sometimes too, but his sound nothing like that. So they sound a lot more demanding, a lot more clear, concise. Mm -hmm. You del definitely tell the difference there. But chuckles are quick, grunts are longer. So here's the difference, here's chuckles. Here's grunts. There's some guys that say elk are speaking a language and they're saying this or they're saying that with the different vocalizations. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I haven't really studied it that much. I kind of look for, I kind of look at what the bull's doing and I kind of look at what his temperature is or how mad he is and I kind of try to call to that. If, you know, a surefire way is to try to mimic them. And, and let them escalate. Always let them escalate. And when they escalate, it's that's when, the time when you bring the heat. Punch them in the face. So can you walk us through the kind of fundamentals of the grunt, comparatively to what you walked us through with the chuckles, so guys can kind of get that rudimentary beginning sound of the grunts? Yep. So chuckles, remember we talk, kind of talked earlier, it's that exaggerated cow call. So it's just kind of a quick, you're just hitting that high note real quick with your tongue and then adding your voice, inflecting your voice and then that punch to the gut. Now, for the grunts, you're, you're letting that high note linger longer. You're letting it carry out a little bit longer. Chuckles. And then grunts. Got to elongate the grunts a bit. And you'll kind of hear some pitch variations in that high note too. And a lot of that has to do with back pressure. Back pressure is the amount of air that you put in the tube that doesn't just blow out the end. That's why it's so important. You know, there's a lot of guys that say, oh, just go to the Walmart, buy yourself a plastic baseball bat, cut the end off it, done. You got yourself a $5 bugle tube. The problem with that is there's no back pressure on those tubes and you have to blow incredibly hard. When you're blowing incredibly hard, you wear out your reeds maturely and you don't get quite the sounds. Sure. So if you have a tube like the Unleashed tube, like the Renegade tube, it does look a lot like those plastic ball bass, but there's actually a lot of engineering behind mm -hmm. airflow in these things. That way you put it so much air in, this little lip on the end collects the air, curls it and sends it back. Whenever I'm grunting or chuckling, I can actually feel a little puff of air coming back against my lips in between each call. So it's important, and by you having that, you don't have to put so much air in, and it lets you change those notes and articulate those notes a little better. All right, again, he's making this stuff look very, very easy, but uh, learning the fundamentals and then kind of practicing those initial notes and then kind of bringing them all together with the tube is uh, gonna be very helpful as you guys continue practicing it leading up to the season. So the next one we're gonna focus and talk about is the lip ball. 
Another one that a lot of guys might struggle with, you kind of have a combination of your standard full bugle and then adding in a new dynamic. So Dirk's gonna kind of walk us through how to do a lip ball. Lip balls were incredibly hard for me for a long time. They're just, they're difficult. I think everybody struggles with them a little bit. And what I found is how I kind of cured my, my problems with it is I sat down one winter and I'm like, you know, by golly, I'm just gonna figure this out. Don't practice what you're good at. Let's say if you're really good at cow calls, don't practice those. If you're really good at like just a full bugle, you don't need to practice that. Practice what you suck at, which for me was lip balls. So I feel like the biggest problem I had was my lips buzzing the right way. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna sit around the house watching TV or whatever, buzzing my lips. My wife looked at me like I was an idiot. Well, she always does, but she looked at me like, what are you doing over there? And you're buzzing your lips. Now, I struggled in the beginning because I thought you had to buzz with the front part of your lip, but I found if I buzz the side part of my lip, it worked better for me. A lot of people are not that way. You may find it works better in the middle. You may, you may find it works better on the right or left. You just never know. You have to experiment with it. But by sitting here and doing this, <laughs> And it seems redundant, boring as can be. People are gonna be looking at it if you're driving in your truck down the freeway or at the stoplight, <laughs> buzzing your lips and your giggle, <laughs> kind of like a didgeridoo, if you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you have to just get comfortable. And what you'll find as you buzz your lips for 30 seconds or so, they start warming up. And if any of you band geeks out there, if you're a trumpet, trumpet player, before the big performance, trumpet players always buzz their lips yeah, yeah. going into the performance. That way they get their lips loosened up. They get blood flowing in there, it loosens up, and then they buzz better. So, pro tip, buzz your lips a lot if you wanna get, do really good lip balls. So, <laughs> make friends with buzzing. And then once you get comfortable with that buzz, that's when we wanna introduce our reed. And we'll go right back to that mosquito noise. And it seems kinda dumb, and overly simplified, but if you can buzz your lips and make the mosquito noise at the same time, and it's a lot to wrap your head around because your brain, your tongue, your, your <laughs> lips, and then your inner diaphragm of your core, they all have to work together. And the end, at the end, whenever I kind of run out of air and I let it drop off, I add that little <clears throat> punch to the gut at the end too. But to do a full bugle lip ball, now that's even more next level because you have to begin at the beginning. You have to wheeze a little bit with your throat, climb the scale, hit that top note. When you hit that top note, buzz your lips, hold it, stop buzzing, drop off, and punch to the gut. So it's very complicated and a lot going on, but it just takes practice, guys. And I'm not saying you have to practice an hour a day. I'm thinking 10, 15 minutes a day. Maybe every day when you get home from work, you walk in the garage and you're like, oh, there's my calls. I'm gonna blow the calls a little bit before I go in the house and make everybody mad. So it's just little bits and practices. And what you're doing is you're teaching your brain, your lips, your tongue, your core, everything to work together. Here's that full bugle with the lip ball. <laughs> Sounds so dang good. So in your experience, when are you typically breaking out that lip ball full bugle variety? There's a lot of different schools of thought on calling out. There's some guys that say, yeah, never bugle like a big bull. Bugle like a spike, because you'll scare off those big herd bulls with big bugles. I'm a completely 100% opposite of that. I feel like Big bull, I bugle as big as I can because I know in here I sound real big, but you walk 100 yards in the timber, it doesn't sound that big actually. And a lot of these big herd bulls, especially if they're not super pressured, they have an ego. And they're like, oh, you think you're tough? You go bugling up there like a raghorn spike, you're nothing special, you're not a threat. He's like, that guy's got nothing. You come up there with some big bugles, big aggressive bugles, some blip balls, he's, he thinks, oh, I have a rival and he'll come check you out, he'll get defensive. So if a bull is making those big gnarly lip ball bugles, I'm doing the big gnarly lip ball bugles. Yeah. Remember, call it the temperature of the bull. So really he's just got a whole variety of calls and we'll get into like a sequence here in a minute where Dirk can really kind of put together 
a lot of what you just learned into an actual hypothetical scenario where he might actually throw that at a bull. The one last thing I'd love to kind of cover with you, Trevor from Born and Raised did this on a hunt we were on in Wyoming, but it's the bark chuckle, bark scream. Talk us through that concept and then walk us through how to actually perform that call. Okay, a lot of times, you know, when you're hunting, let's say you've called with this bull for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, they come into 50 yards, haven't, he hasn't shown himself yet, and he's hung up. It's just classic elk hunting, right? The bull came in and hung up. I don't know how many times a year we hear it's like, you know, I can call the elk and get them coming in, but they always hang up. And they come in and then they bark. And a lot of people think, oh, bull barked. The game's over, throw the tube on the ground, let's go back to the truck and let's go back to camp and have some eggs. Um, but don't throw in the towel because that bull, he's not spooked. He's, he has come in, you know, let's say, you know, the, you know, the wind's right. You've been concealed. He hasn't seen you moving around, but he's came in and he's kind of been hung up for a bit and he starts barking at you. That's him trying to tell you, Hey, show yourself. Yeah. You have to think of the scenario. Elk, bugle, they come together, they fight. You know, this one comes this far. He's wanting you to come the rest of the way or at least show yourself. If you watch elk interact in the wild, they come together, they show themselves, they display, they kind of parade around, they size each other up. Sometimes they fight, sometimes they're like, no, I don't want to fight. And they kind of go their separate ways. But they want to get that visual, they're very visual. So if they come in and they haven't seen another elk standing there, they bark a few times saying, hey, show yourself, and you don't come out and show yourself as an elk, they lose interest and leave. So when that happens, I kind of get excited because what I'm going to do is I'm going to bark back and then move up. Especially if I know that bull is behind some a screen of, of trees or brush where I know he can't see me. Let's say he's 50 yards, I'm moving up 25. So now I'm 25 yards from him. And when I do it, I bark and I scream or I bark and I chuckle. Kind of depends on what he did. If he barked and chuckled, I may bark and chuckle and move up. Or if he barked and, and then bugled afterwards, I'll bark and do a big challenge scream right behind it and then I'll move up. And I'm not Elmer Fudding it. No, I bark and scream, I put my arrow away. You don't want to run around with an arrow out. I, that's like a huge like yeah. thing for me. I don't want to get fall down clumsy as hell. I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> I don't want to get shish kebab. Yeah. But I'll bark, scream, and I will break every single branch that I can in between me and that, that 25 yards I'm gonna cover. So I'm gonna cover that 25 yards quickly, as noisy as I can, get to that spot, and as I'm looking, I'm at that 25 yards, maybe it's 28 yards, maybe it's 22 yards, I'm getting to a spot where I can shoot, where I'll have a little bit of a clearing. So I'll get to that spot, make a bunch of noise, stop as soon as I get there, knock an arrow and get ready. And I might even scream again, or bark and scream again. And at that point, that bull, he heard you commit. He heard you come closer. Now he's gonna be curious. And it's not always the, the come in frontal shot, They'll come out sideways, broadside, and kind of take a look. And, then, and if you're ready, and if he's not obscured by brush, you got him. So another just amazing tip, tactic, uh, situational thing that maybe you guys can incorporate sometime this fall. Dirk's gonna now put that to the test and uh, let you guys see what it, hear, what it sounds like. So a bark is basically kind of like that exaggerated cow call or an exaggerated chuckle, right? kind of put those two together and then they over exaggerate even more. We're putting more air onto this call than any other call we're gonna do. We're putting tons of air volume on over, over the call and a bunch of your voice inflection at the end. So you want it to be super loud and super uh, concise. <coughs> So depending on what the bull was doing before, we'll kind of dictate if I bark chuckle or bark scream. But I really like the bark scream because that just says, hey, I'm coming for you, let's go. Show yourself, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, show me your cards. Yeah. Show me your cards. And a lot of times they do. Sometimes they run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not to say, you know, 60% 60 of the time it works every yeah. time. But sometimes they run like hell and it's okay because they'll run away and stop and they'll bugle at you. And then if you're like hot on their heels and be like, oh, no you don't, go hot on their heels, that's good. Really help do that. Yeah. The other thing to consider, if that, that bull has come to a certain place and hung up, chances are they're comfortable up into that spot. 
So there's a good potential that if they did come back in, they're gonna at least know they can get to that spot. The bark, chuckle, bark, scream situation worked great. We were with Born and Raised in Montana. Trevor's birthday bull, we'll link the video somewhere right in here to go check it out. But Trevor got very aggressive, got into that same situation where the bull hung up. It was almost dark. He pulled that one out after uh, he and Dirk had many conversations prior and he killed the bull. It was an awesome experience. First time I'd ever actually heard it in person in, a lot, in an actual scenario. So Dirk, we've run through the whole gamut from a calf call to the most aggressive calls you can come up with. Uh, let's put a sequence together for the people and just kind of <coughs> run the table, Dirk, as if you were in a call contest. Show the people at home what you're working with. Okay. We'll just go from the, the beginning calls, right? Start yeah. to finish and, and uh, we'll roll with that. So good. Okay, so obviously you just saw Dirk run the gamut in a full sequence. Absolutely incredible what he's capable of. You might be thinking though, the diaphragm call just isn't for me. Maybe you know, you've know you got an issue that just doesn't quite work for you. The good news is uh, the guys at Phelps have been in the process of designing an alternative that honestly anybody can use. So Dirk's gonna walk us through the new product. It's dropping on the 22nd of July. Yep. And so it'll be available at their website or in various retailers. But Dirk's gonna talk to you guys about this new product if you're not interested in using a diaphragm call. Guys, I'm pretty excited about this new call. I've been working on this for the last two years on this mouthpiece. You know, a lot of external bugles, they just don't have a lot of depth of capability. They, you can bugle with them okay, but you just can't chuckle with them or you can't get a lot of variety uh, of different calls out of them. So we wanted to have something that was user-friendly, number one, and something that was very capable of making lots of different calls. So, and I think we nailed it. We got the easy, easy bugler mouthpiece here on our new metal bugle tube. And you say, metal bugle tube? What in the world? What the hey, Bobby? <laughs> um, it's an all metal bugle tube, all aluminum. This thing is sandblasted, anodized. You could hit home runs and dingers with this thing. <laughs> or call elk. It's got a neoprene tube cover on it. One of the big problems with uh, bugle tubes in the past, you know, the bigger tubes, is, is noise. They're kind of noisy. If you notice, they, they get a little bit of a, a thump to them. It hasn't been too much of an issue for me, but a lot of folks don't like a, a noisy tube. So with this thing, with this neoprene cover and everything, I think dead silent. So if you bang it on your bow, it's gonna not gonna be noisy. Going through brush, it's not gonna be noisy. And then that, that metal bugle tube, you might say, well, wh why metal? Well, this thing is specifically tuned to hit that high ringing note that carries a long ways. And a lot of times, let's, Let's face it, a lot of time when you're calling bulls, that high ringing note really gets a good reaction on them, gets them fired up, gets them coming in. So we wanted a tube that would kind of focus a lot of its power onto that, and I think we nailed it here. So this Easy Bugler mouthpiece, it's basically got a normal diaphragm frame and latex. It's easily removed, all you gotta do is pop it off. Pops in and out, there's a little silicon gasket there. In and out, stays in place real nice, very durable. And I think it sounds great. It does, yeah. Let's hear it. <laughs> And this thing's super versatile. Let's say you didn't know a thing about how to blow one of these calls. It's, it's designed specifically to blow like this at this angle. So that way the tube's up, out, it's gonna broadcast throughout the landscape. But if you 
did it wrong, took it out of the package, and never seen anybody blow one of these. You could do it upside down. A lot of externals, they just are tough to chuckle with. If you can go, which is kind of funny. Um, if you can do that, you can chuckle on this thing or grunt. And you might say, well, Dirk, that guy could blow a blade of grass and, and make an elk sound of it. But honestly, this thing's pretty easy to use. If, if you just use your voice and do this little, uh, if you can do, uh, you can blow it. Now let's say you're a, you're not a you're not into one of these external bugles. You're more of a diaphragm guy. That's cool because we got one of those too. The diaphragm model has an external mouthpiece, kind of flared. That way it's nice and comfortable. It's got a venturi system on the inside. That way you get good back pressure and the right note articulation. And it's removable. Let's say you want both. You want the double threat. Cool. These pop off. You just swap them out. They come in three different camo patterns on these neoprene covers. We got Switzerland of camos, which is called multicam, or you can get it in two first light, cipher and fusion. Here's the, uh, here's the diaphragm model. <laughs> So anyway, I think this it's I think it's going to be a home run, if you will, um, <laughs> uh, this year. It's pretty pretty cool. We're pretty excited about them. Those are awesome, man. Yeah. So got everything covered. If you want to use a diaphragm call, we've got the traditional plastic unleashed bugle tube. Or if you're looking for the external bugle, they've got that now available the 22nd of July. And then the jack of all trade, if you want to just the, the metal bugle, you can do that as well. So literally everything you could ever ask for from an elk call situation, Phelps has got you guys covered. All right, guys, there you have it. From uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Dirk the Bugler Durham. Uh, make sure you guys go give him a follow. We'll link his Instagram right here. And I hope you took something valuable out of that video. Certainly, we learned a lot. We're going to spend some time messing around with Dirk here. Uh, and good luck this fall. Make sure you go check out Dirk and keep practicing, guys. September is almost here. Killed it, Dirk. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks.